you for your great love. For your love and your greatest sacrifice for us on the cross. Oh, what a love. Lord, even today, help us. Lord, to understand a little more better, Lord. So that we can give our lives. Love demands a sacrifice. And that is why you came down to give your life as a sacrifice. May that love constrain us also today to give our lives as a sacrifice for you. Speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Thank God for this blessed opportunity to come here. And to have fellowship with all of you. Truly, God has been doing great things in our midst from the very first day first night and speaking to us great things he has taught us and according to that word in each meeting God has been doing great things you may have got some feedback some of you may have experienced those blessings please do share it with the ministers of your assembly so that the name of the Lord may be glorified for all that the Lord has done. Thank you for praying for Pastor M.T. Thomas, for Pastor J.M. and me. Do continue to uphold us in your prayers. Truly God is doing a great work wherever we go. We can see the, there's a great move of the Holy Spirit so freely, unlike before. Hardly anything has to be done. The Holy Spirit is just moving, moving so mightily because he knows there is but a little, a very little time left. We are in the, not only in the 11th hour, we are in the last moments of this 11th hour, awaiting that moment of the rapture. We have only one opportunity. We don't want to miss it. Because we know the consequence, what will follow after the rapture if we are left behind. So today, the message God has given me, I prayed. Then I, when I came, I asked a fellow minister to pray for God to make the message clear to me. And then the following day, God made it clear to me. So that's what I'm going to share with you. It is simple. It's Basically, speaking about getting ready for the rapture and um, that we need to be victorious, sanctified. But the initial experience I'm going to touch on today is about repentance, but more deeply about water baptism. You may have heard it. You may not have heard it. Every truth has its depths. So the way the apostles teach it, it's a mystery. As we heard, it's a mystery of faith. The mystery is a hidden truth. So through the preaching of the gospel, we receive that faith. So now, for so today, with this morning, I'll try by the grace of God, may the Holy Spirit operate and do His work and speak and make us understand clearly it's a detailed experience about water baptism in between the points that I'm going to share. I'm going to read it to you and uh, uh, listen carefully. If you listen carefully, you will, we sang just now, when we all get to heaven, what a joy, what a day of rejoicing. When we all get to heaven, we'll sing and shout the victory. If you take heed to this truth, as you hear it this morning, all that you heard in this convention also, we'll sing and shout the victory 
when Jesus comes. It's not just a song to make us glad uh, emotionally, to make us happy. You are going to really sing and shout the victory. So therefore, let us now turn to the word of God. We will first read 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Please read verse 24 and 25. And by the grace of God, I'll be reading all the rest of the scriptures just to save the time. Please read 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 24 and 25. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So here we read about a race. Our Christian life is a compared to a race it's not just running but we should run to win the prize we should run to obtain it so what is written here therefore we should what is written here is to obtain it we should if you want to strive for the mastery, we should be temperate. Temperate in all things. Then we are going to obtain an, in, an incorruptible crown. So mastery here, for us, it means obtaining an overcoming life. So we are running a race. We need to obtain an overcoming life. Then we have to become that perfected, sanctified overcomers who will then be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. The prize that we are running to win is the Lord Jesus. Paul the Apostle wrote, he was willing to consecrate everything and count them as loss. He went through sufferings because he forsook all that he had to become an apostle according to God's calling by God's grace. And all that, though he had to go through all that sufferings, he said in Philippians 3 verse 8, he said, I still have counted all what I have given up for Christ's sake. I count it as dung done compared to winning christ it it is done so nothing in this life nothing in this life can be compared to christ to winning christ so to obtain the mastery if you want to win the prize if you want to win the prize we should be temperate so what does it mean we have to have a control in our lives in all areas of our lives we must have a control a limitation do everything do everything with a limit and that's why it says in verse uh, 26 and 27 i therefore so run not as uncertainly so fight I not as one that beat at the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. So, we have to run the spiritual race, striving for the mastery, overcoming life, and that demands the surrender of our entire body to God as a living sacrifice. 
And uh, so the Holy Spirit will help us to mortify the deeds of the body. We have to keep this body under subjection, lest we become a cast away. So, we have to understand that how to yield our bodies to God. When we read the word of God, we read about presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. Some do not believe in the dedication and surrender of their body to God. They give their heart to God. So they say, so that they may not go to hell, but they keep back their body to do their own will and pleasure. And then they wonder why they are living a defeated life continually, overcome by all kinds of temptation and trials. If we want to be able to overcome all things, even in this body, all that this body faces in this life, if we want our bodies too to be sanctified for the rapture, we have to present this body as a living sacrifice unto God. Why should we surrender our bodies as a living sacrifice to God? At one time, we surrendered our bodies to sin. The nature of sin, readiness, you heard in the, during the time of worship, about the last, the first Adam, the nature of sin through that disobedient nature, all kinds of sin had dominion over us. And we were the servants to that sinful nature of disobedience inherited by birth from that first Adam, because we are descendants of that first Adam. And we surrendered ourselves as servants to serve that disobedient nature. Whatever it prompted us to do, we did it. But now, in the truth of, after repenting of our sins, through the truth of baptism, we are made free from sin. And now we have become servants to God, to serve God, to do His will. So, that is why we should yield our bodies to God. As a living sacrifice, as it says, I'll just touch on it now and later I'll go into detail. In Romans chapter 6, in verse 17, God, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, servants to that sinful, disobedient nature. We yielded ourselves willingly. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, the truth of baptism. Then, now we are yielding ourselves as servants to God, or servants to righteousness, to do the God's will, according to God's word. Verse 22, being now made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. And so, only a yielded body, a body that's yielded to do God's will by obeying God's word, can be sanctified holy and can be transformed 
to bring forth fruit unto holiness and righteousness, as it says in, ver in verse 19, the latter part of verse 19, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness. We can bring forth fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Again, why should we dedicate our body to God? Firstly, because he has set us free from the nature of sin in the truth of baptism. If not, as it says in verse 19, we would still be yielding our members to iniquity, to disobey God, doing our own will. As a result, our bodies will become servants or in bondage to all kinds of unclean things, unclean works of sin, things which are lustful and which defile us, not only in our soul and spirit, but in our body too. We become servants to uncleanness, to iniquity and to iniquity. Thank God you set us free. So that is why we have to yield our body first, first of all to God. Secondly, why should we yield, dedicate our body to God? The word of God says, once it belonged to Satan. It did not belong to us. It belonged to Satan. When we committed sin, we, be, we were servants or slaves to that sin. Behind every sin is an evil spirit. So we were slaves to all kinds of spirits. We had no power to get out of the sins. We were slaves. And uh, Satan was a, a, the one who ruled over our lives, the prince of the power of the air. And uh, bringing all, working through our heart, bringing all kinds of desires, through the desires of the flesh and mind. He was defiling us, taking control of us. So why, what did Jesus do? Jesus, he has given his body, he paid that price, his perfect sacrifice, which was the demand of God's law, the wages of sin is death. So he met the demands of God's law, he gave his perfect sinless life for us, tasting death for us by the grace of God. So thereby he has paid that price to redeem us. So when we understood his sacrifice for us, repented of our sins, accepted him as our Lord and Savior, he redeemed us. He not only bought us, we became his possession, his property, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. He was 20, you are bought with a price, the price of his own blood. Therefore glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which are God's, your body, soul and spirit. Glorify God. Further, he has also baptized us after obeying in the truth of baptism. He has baptized us in the Holy Spirit. Now it has become the temple of the Holy Spirit, where the triune God indwells us. Who are we? What are we? That the triune God heavens cannot contain him he that he would want to come and dwell in such finite beings like us who are only given to uncleanness and filthiness it cannot be comprehended that love of god it take us all eternity will not be enough to comprehend the love of god which passes knowledge when we think of all this it makes us to understand why we should yield our body to god Dedicate it as a living sacrifice. The moment we decide, as we heard last night in the message, we are our own, we are our own, uh, we, we are our own lords. We don't need God to be our king. The moment we decide to do whatever we want to do to be our own king, that moment. We are coming out from that work or that experience of redemption through which Jesus has purchased our spirit, soul and body. We are now open. Satan is able to 
enter there's a door through that sin which we have yielded to there is a door open for satan it is no more sealed by the blood of jesus he can enter and do anything to us but the mercy of god will not allow him to destroy us that is one thing but be aware we are bought with the price of his blood if we are not bought we will be belonging to satan he can do whatever he wants with us never never contemplate even for a moment to do something and to of your own selves and become your own king so this is the second reason why we have to yield our bodies to god he has paid that great price which no one else could pay the whole world what shall it profit a man what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul even the whole world cannot purchase your soul your soul is so precious only the blood of jesus could purchase it therefore let it remain as his possession we are not our own anymore this is why we need to yield our body to god further we read about the lord jesus it is written he said in hebrews chapter 10 verses 5 to 7 hebrews chapter 10 verses 5 to 7 here he said that wherefore when he cometh into the world he said sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not but a body has thou prepared me verse 7 then said i lo i come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will o god so therefore our redeemed body must now it is a prepared body redeemed and in the truth of baptism a further work has been done to prepare it therefore this body that has been prepared redeemed and prepared must be surrendered to do god's will that is what the lord jesus did in his body which was prepared so understanding what he did for us because of his love for us for us as we heard on the second night about the love of god and touched about the on the first love when we think of the sacrifice of jesus when i think of it i am an unworthy sinner i am only worthy of hellfire and then eternally the eternal place of torment the lake of fire so when i think of jesus who gave his life for me who saved me when i think of my salvation as often as i can think of it remember it daily i can only be filled with gratitude i am humbled to think that he would give his life for me an unworthy sinner of eternal to for unworthy sinner unworthy of eternal life who is only worthy of hellfire that love constrains me when i think of his love that made him to give his life for me that holy spotless sinless perfect life it makes me now constrains me now to want to lay down my life for him not just to do his will but to give it as a living sacrifice so think of his sacrifice think of your salvation we had the day about the they celebrated the feast of the passover they had to celebrate it once a year to remember how god brought them out from the slavery in egypt we are meant to remember the salvation as often as we can even if we can do it daily it's good that love of god will always be there that first love how he saved an unworthy sinner as i thinking of that love i am only worthy of that lake of fire he gave me to the life then what can i say further 
he has done that work for me to partake of his will of his obedience in baptism he has given me his obedient nature he has given me his holy spirit he's made me the temple of god then for me he has called me to serve him to be one among the 144,000 in zion who will stand with him on mount zion who will be with him on the throne i cannot comprehend that all i can do is in that gratitude to be able to give my life to him wholly constrained it willing to give my life and to die for him for his sake in doing the will of god then why should we give this body to god so i mentioned three points now because he has delivered us from the sinful nature and made us servants to god through the work he has done to the truth of baptism secondly first he has bought us through his precious blood redeemed us therefore we belong to him otherwise we would have belonged to satan and we would only have gone to the lake of fire thirdly his body was prepared to do the will of do the will of god so that he could redeem us and that love he gave his life to die, die for us so now this body that has been prepared after repenting of our sins and prepared to the truth of baptism has to be given to god to do his will being constrained by the love of god that first love then why should we give our body this body is sealed for the day of redemption the lord has sealed this body for the day of redemption we read that in ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 it says grieve not the holy spirit of god whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption the holy spirit has come into our lives seal this i have come into you and as we yield our life to be sanctified to the power of the blood of jesus the power of the word of truth and the power of the holy spirit the holy spirit has come and sealed us i have come into you i have sealed you for the day of redemption i will do all i have to do to make you ready for the day of the redemption that is the day of the rapture he is, has sealed us therefore when jesus comes for his sanctified church who is sanctified by the blood of christ and the word of truth and the power of the holy spirit he is going to raise us up if we surrender ourselves in this manner it's a living sacrifice he is going to raise us up immortal incorruptible with a powerful body with a glorious body like unto his glorious body so therefore this is why we should surrender our lives to god now coming back about the work of preparation for the coming of the lord we need to understand according to this mystery of the faith the doctrine preached by the apostles these hidden truths the work of entire sanctification this is one of the truths the work of, vict uh, of obtaining a victorious life or coming to a victorious life it is a secret work of the holy spirit in us and it is like how a chick would come out would out of an egg that would hatch after a period of incubation of being uh, formed in that in that shell for 21 days there are some eggs that would just be rotten eggs unfit for co uh, consumption and has to be just uh, cast away that's what i mentioned to you earlier let not let us not become a castaway so but there are among those eggs after that period of incubation beautiful colorful chicks will hatch and just like that 
as we are yielding to this work of entire sanctification growing in this victorious life god will transform us from glory to glory into his character image perfect as he is his character image is perfection this is the work of the holy spirit and so we can be sure we will be among those who are going to be caught up when we sing the song when i sing the song i was rejoicing in my heart holy spirit is confirming yes yes what a day of rejoicing i'm going to be caught up holy spirit giving me that confirmation i'm going to be caught up thank god so we should be able to have the holy spirit will be able to say uh, we together with the holy spirit will be able to say come lord jesus so the word of god says about the rapture in first corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 and 52 it says behold i show you a mystery the rapture is a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed we shall all be changed in a moment verse 52 in the twinkling of an eye at the last drum for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed in a moment in a in a wink that's how long it's going to last the lord jesus spoke about the coming of the lord in matthew chapter the lord just spoke about his imminent return he said in matthew chapter 24 and verse 27 for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west so shall also the coming of the son of man be so he is going to come was 28 for where so the carcasses there will the eagles be gathered together we are the eagle saints who are going to fly away with jesus when he comes and so verse 27 it's going to happen all the world is going to see is as though a lightning has flashed across the sky they're not going to see the perfected saints being cut out but we who are going to be transformed we can see the others see us ourselves being caught up and we can see the others also being caught up the dead and perfected in christ and the living and perfected in christ so in a wink that's how long that's how quick the rapture is going to take place and the graves are going to be opened the dead in christ are going to rise first all in a wink first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 and 17 for the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel with the trump of god and the dead in christ shall rise first the dead in christ who are perfected in christ who were perfected in christ then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the lord we who are alive and perfected in christ the final work of grace or perfection will be done at that moment by the holy spirit and so only those who are really prepared for the rapture can hear that shout the son of man will son of god will descend from heaven with a shout the voice of the ark with the voice of the archangel they can hear it the trump of god only those who are really prepared or those who have become perfect in christ and so we are going to see our bodies transformed paul the apostle wrote in philippians chapter 3 verse 21 about the rapture he said who shall now is changing us inwardly from glory to glory transforming us and making us more like him but finally in verse 21 philippians chapter 3 verse 21 who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned 
like unto his glorious body. When Jesus comes, this vile body is going to be trans fashioned, transformed like unto his glorious body. How? Whereby he is able, according to his working, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. How is it going to be transformed at the rapture? It is according to how much the power of the Holy Spirit has been working in our lives. We may be any place, at the workplace, in, our, in the colleges, it may be at, at night while we are asleep, at any moment when Jesus comes, that final work of transformation would have been done. But it all depends how much, how much you have been giving room to the working of the Holy Spirit with power. It is not enough just to speak a few tongues. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, the Lord spoke of it. The Word of God says, by one Spirit, you are all baptized into one body. Understand this very clearly. For the transformation of the rapture in a moment in a wing, it's just not for everyone, but those who have given room to the mighty operation of the Holy Spirit, speaking tongues with power, with that fullness of that power. It is not an option. If there is not enough power, it's like the rocket. It needs such a power to fly into outer space. An aeroplane also can take off, but it can only go to a certain height. If the power you have is like that of an aeroplane, you will still be here. I will still be here. Let me put myself in that place. If the power that I am receiving, if I am getting filled only with that much, I can take off from this earth. I can live a certain life spiritually in heavenly places, but it will not be enough to be transformed and to like unto his glorious body at the rapture and to be taken all the way to Zion and for the church, New Jerusalem. So it depends on how the transformation now changing us from glory to glory and finally the rapture to change his body, wild body like unto his glorious body, depends according to his working. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are baptized into the body of Christ, the church of God, the mystical body of Christ. But thereafter, every infilling is compared to drinking into that one spirit. So, it is like, I'm thirsty, I'm just going to drink a little bit. But I cannot drink all of it at this moment. That's how much I can drink. So, it depends on how much you are willing to drink. If you each time when you get filled in spirit, you drink and drink and drink till you cannot drink anymore. That is the experience whereby you are surely being changed from glory to glory as you claim the word of God and experience that transformation of the Holy Spirit. That's why you notice in each meeting, the pastors are coming up here saying, get filled in the spirit, get filled in the spirit. To get filled in the spirit, it comes by through the inspiration of the word. It doesn't come by any other means. Through faith. So that's why they speak a word to stir us up, to inspire us. And when we claim it, it does, the Holy Spirit does the work of transformation. But when we get filled in the spirit, we must drink till we cannot drink anymore. Then it is, this wild body is going to be changed like unto his glorious body at Jesus comes. So understand this. It is not an option. It, it is something that we must understand and now hereafter practice. Even if nobody says get filled in the spirit, no one need to tell me I will do it. Because I want to get ready for the rapture. And you want to get ready for the rapture. Shall we all shout a hallelujah? Hallelujah! Hallelujah means praise the Lord. So God is giving us grace with that praise. Hereafter, we are not going to neglect it. So I'm trying to finish early today. I want to give room to the Spirit of God for a short while. 
before we end this meeting, according to the time that God gives to share what is remaining, here we read that when Paul the Apostle writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm again referring to the body now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 53, for this corruptible, we already read 51 and 52 about the rapture, the mystery. Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So, he is not referring to the change in the inner man here. He is speaking about the body. This corruption must put on incorruption. This corruptible body must be transformed into an incorruptible body. This mortal body must be transformed into an immortal body. So, that's what it says in the verse before that, a few verses before in verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, this body, sown as a corruptible body, at the rapture, raised in incorruption. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor, it's a dishonorable body, a vile body. It is raised in glory, a glorious body. It is sown in weakness, a weak body. It is raised in power, a powerful body. Verse 44, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. So, therefore, we must yield ourselves fully to God. But to add to that, for God to do this work in us, to sanctify us, to transform us, we also need to go through trials in our lives. We also need to go through trials in our life so that's the need for trials trials this work of entire sanctification can only be done attained through the trial of faith and so when we use the free will god has given us to to serve him to do his will in our body then god will also Make provision for us to be sanctified entirely in our spirit, soul, and body. And Satan won't keep quiet. Satan will send numerous trials against us. But God is controlling it. He will not suffer, according to First Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 There had no temptation taken you but such as is common to men but God is faithful who will not suffer you, allow you to be tempted above that you are able but with, will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You don't have to do something outside of that the truths opposite, uh, against the truths uh, apart from the truths which you have already learned. God is not Allowing Satan to bring these trials in your life for you to do that. Understand that. God allows him for your sanctification. So all we have to do is for my sanctification, God allows it. All we have to do is therefore yield ourselves to God again in the midst of the trials. And that is how the church, the body of Christ as a whole, is going to be sanctified before the coming of the Lord. The very God of peace will sanctify us in our spirit, soul and body thereby as we yield ourselves to God in the midst of the trials. According to the word of God, the truths which we have received. First Thessalonians 5.23 where The very God and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. If you yield yourself to God in the midst of the trial, according to the truth which you have heard, he will sanctify us solely in our spirit, whole spirit, whole soul, whole body. And preserve us blameless, perfect, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, faithful is he who calls you, who will do it. So, in order to be conformed to his very image or his divine uh, nature or his character we have to go through sufferings 
One, th- one part of it is to put off sin. I'm going to explain to you about the truth of baptism a little later. The other part is we have to go through sufferings. And, but in the midst of the sufferings, according to the same truths which we have heard, you can claim it. In the midst of the sufferings, we can rejoice in all our sufferings for Christ's sake. As we heard yesterday, Jesus is with us bearing that yoke. He is taking the, uh, that whole burden of that yoke. So our sufferings are not for Christ, for Christ's sake. We are suffering with Christ. Pastor Tew Thomas used to stress that. We are not suffering for Christ. We are suffering for Christ's sake or we are suffering with Christ. So beautiful. So, and so therefore, we can rejoice in all our sufferings for Christ, knowing, as it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, knowing that all that God is permitting in our lives, verse 28, and we know that all things, shall we all read it together? One, two, three. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Are you called according to His purpose? Then, or do you love God? He's not for those whom God loves. The word doesn't say for those whom God loves. For those who love God. So we are those who love God. We are called according to His purpose. What is His purpose? Verse 29, for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image to be conformed to the image of his son his character image which is his perfection to be perfect in his character that is his purpose so when we go through sufferings we can rejoice why through these sufferings he is doing all things for my good that this purpose concerning me may be fulfilled perfected that i should become perfect in his character so will it bring any sorrow never it will only bring joy uh, on the contrary we will be thanking god and we understand he's doing that work what will we do when god is doing a good work we won't keep quiet we will say thank you our thanks will not just be limited we will be praising you're going to make me perfect for this sufferings lord i thank you you have done a work another work of perfection we'll be praising 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 like we heard today sang today floodgates of god's love will be open and will flood our hearts overflow our hearts and the sufferings will turn to joy the bitter which what should be bitterness will turn to to, the bitter will turn to sweet oh the sorrow what should bring sorrow will be turned to joy shall we praise god hallelujah 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 yes God is giving more grace as we praise God. God is going to give you that experience. That is why we are praising God. Then, so, all things work together for good. Today, there are so many children of God. I have also experienced initially. Uh, there are things that brought bitterness in my heart. Though I wanted God to do that work in my heart. Yeah, when I was a new worker, I found that. I wanted God to do it. I wanted that sufferings, but... I couldn't get over the bitterness. Then I learned this from a senior servant of God who shared it in one meeting. How to give thanks for all that you have gone through in life. If there are any parts that brought sorrow, bitterness, you saw it as evil. Now, recollect all those instances one by one. Thank him with all your heart because he's working it, was working it for your good to be conformed to his character image. Till the love of God oh, floods your heart. Then that sorrow and bitterness all will depart. Joy and love will, and sweetness will fill your heart. So I did that, did that, did that, did that. And all that bitterness, sorrow, all departed. From that day onwards, this was the key. This understanding how to give God thanks. Though till today, I can say, by the grace of God, Oh, is joy unspeakable and full of glory all the trials and the half has never yet been told. Oh, what the joy is going to be at the rapture if now it is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, yes, is joy inexpressible. Yes. Oh, therefore, start doing it. If you haven't done it so far, 
Think, recollect all the instances in your life, one by one. Praise God in this manner. Thank Him. And then you're going to see all the bitter changes of sweet. God is going to transform you and change you from glory to glory. And then um, we uh, need also, we need to understand that we have to uh, experience, we have to experience the as we heard on the, that about the faith, we have to come into the unity of the faith. The doctrine, the doctrines preached by his apostles, Ephesians chapter 4, verse uh, 13. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13 in English, it says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith, unity, unity of the doctrine, faith, doctrine. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, knowledge of his character, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. One of our old chief pastors who expounded the mysteries to us, to whom he was an apostle, was A.C. Thomas, said, It is important what you give your ears to. Don't just give your ear to every preaching of the word of God you must give take it only to listen to the doctrine which is according this the doctrine apostolic doctrine which is speaking about the mysteries which is teaching about this life of sanctification overcoming life perfection don't just listen to any preaching and every preaching what will happen finally because faith comes by hearing the word is up to you you have to be careful then you can be brought together with others having the same doctrine there's a unity that comes to the doctrine so not all are going to be raptured only the perfect this is the apostolic doctrine that is what is written here first you must come to unity of the faith with others who have received the same doctrine but if you are going to listen to every doctrine listen to this doctrine and that doctrine what's going to happen what does the word of god say it's not i what does the word of god say verse 14 that we henceforth be no more tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Some may say, if you are saved, you'll be raptured. Some will say, if you receive the Holy Spirit, you'll be raptured. No. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are born of the Spirit. You are a babe in Christ. Jesus is coming as the bridegroom. He is coming for the bride in Christ. Those who have grown, grown, come to the unity of faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, maturity. Not all are going to be raptured. That is the apostolic doctrine. So don't just go and listen to anyone thinking it's all good. No. Faith comes by hearing the word. There is no time left. Only take heed to the apostolic doctrine, which speaks about this life of sanctification, perfection, overcoming life. You are sure then the Holy Spirit will do that work in you. You are not going to be tossed to and fro with all kinds of winds of doctrine. You won't be children, but you will grow unto a perfect man. Glory to God. So this is why we thank God for all the fellowship we have all over, in all the places where you have come from. Some are living far away. I advise you, somehow get in touch with the workers and get the word of God which is preached by them. Don't go and listen to any other preaching. Faith comes by hearing the word. Only give ear to that doctrine and continue to go. There's no more time left. The Holy Spirit has to do this work in us. Come into the unity of the faith. So that's what we see the first church as an example, as a model for all the church to come. The first century church, Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter, sorry, 2. Acts chapter 2. This is the model for all the church. The first century church. Those who are baptized after listening to the preaching of Paul the Apostle, sorry, Peter the Apostle, in verse 41, then they that gladly received this word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and verse 42, and, and, they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine, and Apostles' fellowship and holy communion and in and in prayers so this is what we need 
This is the model for all the churches until the coming of the Lord. Therefore, let us be steadfast in the apostles' doctrine as far as possible, apostles' fellowship and the meetings, gathering the meetings, then in the breaking of bread also in prayers. That's why I used to stress, tearing meetings are very, very important. It's not enough just to go for a Sunday meeting. You need the tearing meeting because the Holy Spirit has sealed you unto the day of redemption. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. It speaks of the working of this power which will transform you. Tearing meeting is very important. Two hours of getting filled in the Spirit. In worship time, we have a limited time. In the convention, there's much less time. But in your local assemblies, I inquired, there more time is given for filling the Spirit. But it's still limited. In between, there's a prophecy, there are prophecies in between the exhortation, in between the song, but in a tarry meeting, free flow of the Holy Spirit for about two hours. Children of God, be steadfast in the prayers also of the apostles, in the fellowship of the apostles. Then, in your personal life of prayer too. So, therefore, let us be willing to accept the right teaching. Otherwise, if we are not willing to accept only the right teaching which is preached by his apostles, we are going to be tossed to and fro. We are going to get confused. We are going to get confused. What we hear matters. Therefore, let us take it. Then we can be steadfast in our spiritual lives. As we heard last night, the right truth, the apostolic doctrine will nourish you. It will give you a proper vision, a faith and also especially a hope of the future what's going to happen at the rapture and thereafter eternally it will enlighten you it will deliver you the truth will set you free you will never go back as you came how you came this morning you're not going to go back the way you came this is going to deliver us and it's going to add grace it's going to add strength to your life and to your inner man so therefore it will help you to put off the old man put on the new man and change you right now i'm going to touch on some points on the truth of water baptism i'm going to touch on a few points now listen carefully i'm going to actually virtually read it to you now the remaining time that i have left as i said i'm going in early to give room for the holy spirit now listen carefully even if you cannot uh, uh, comprehend all of it i'm sure the holy spirit will help you to understand uh, with the hearts that are enlightened through the word of God, he will help you. Now, this is what is taught through his apostles. There are two types of sin in man. The works of sin, which we commit through our five senses of our body, and the nature of sin. How do we get rid of of the works of sin I'm virtually reading it to you so how do we get rid of the works of sin when we confess our sins with true repentance the blood of Jesus cleanses our sins how do we get rid of the nature of sin in short by taking water baptism what is the nature of sin the nature of sin entered into us because of Adam's disobedience Adam sinned and since then this seed of sin or disobedient nature has been passed down to all mankind we are all sinners we all have this seed of sin in us even if we have not committed any sin that is why it's written in Romans chapter 5 verse 19 for by one man's disobedience many were made sinners many were made sinners that's what it says but as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. I continue. How do we deal with the nature of sin? Only through a perfect obedience can this perfect.
perfect disobedience be cancelled to bring a negative to neutral you need a positive and therefore and this is because we cannot do anything the best of our obedience that we try to obey by ourselves the best of our obedience that we offer Jesus is tainted because of the nature of sin that is in us so where can we find this perfect obedience to cancel out this nature of disobedience that we are born with if you take it to this truth you are going to live in victory where can we find this perfect obedience to cancel out this nature of disobedience that we are born with now about the perfect obedience of christ perfect obedience of christ jesus knew we could not help ourselves he was the only one who could save us he came as a man to save us from our sin as a human being he had a free will at any time he could have disobeyed but at every step all the way to the cross he obeyed and obeyed and obeyed finally in his death on the cross jesus was made perfect in obedience philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to 8 says that to be clear that is from philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to 8 don't need to don't need to display don't display it to be clear it is in the death of christ we find perfect obedience nowhere else do we find perfect obedience the perfect obedience of jesus alone can cancel the perfect disobedience of adam in us how do we partake of that perfect obedience through water baptism god ordained water baptism so that we could partake of the death and burial of jesus it is written in romans chapter 6 verse 3 and 4 you can see the verse displayed as i read to you the explanation when you take baptism you are buried into the death of Christ or into the perfect obedience of Christ. From that point, we are covered by the obedience of Christ. So when God sees us, He sees the obedience of His Son. We are made righteous before God. That is what we read now in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, the second part of that verse so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous so when we partake of the truth of baptism he imparts his obedience to us that obedient nature becomes a part of our nature that is written that is why it's written so by the by the obedience of one of jesus shall many be made righteous or shall many be made obedient then what happens to the nature of sin jesus death is a perfect sacrifice for sin it is a sin offering through his death he made a perfect atonement for sin that's written in romans chapter 8 verse 3 he gave god sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin and for sin there means as a perfect atonement for sin to atone means to cancel so through his death he made a perfect atonement for sin therefore the accusation against us is cancelled instead the old man the nature of sin disobedience the old man is pronounced guilty when we partake of the truth of baptism to obey god and so the old man is pronounced guilty 
And so the old man is condemned in the flesh. This is what we preach. This is the apostolic doctrine. The old man is condemned in the flesh. Romans 8.3 Sin is condemned in the flesh. In the flesh means in our body. What is the meaning of condemned? It means judged, sentenced to death, and locked up. Judged, sentenced to death, and locked up. That old man is condemned in your flesh. So therefore, what the law could not do, it that it was weak to the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Now, there's something else formed in us, a body that was formed in us through all the sins we committed in the past before knowing Christ. You need to understand that. It is called a body of sin. Why do we need to understand that? Because even after you take baptism, you can still form another body of sin if you still go on sinning. So that is why Romans chapter 6, verse 5 and 6 says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Water baptism is a planting together in the likeness of his death. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, we are raised out of the water. Uh, it's a sign of uh, being raised with Jesus. That is why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the experience of the likeness, partaking of the likeness of his resurrection. So I believe last night in the prayer, many would have received the Holy Spirit in the days of this convention. So you have partaken in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. When you repent of your sins, confess and forsake all the sins you committed in the past, one by one. The old man is being crucified, put to open shame. You are not put to open shame. The old man is put to open shame. And he is being crucified. And then this body of sin that has been formed in us through the sins which we have committed... What happens to it? In water baptism, the old man and the body of sin is buried. And that body of sin is destroyed. That body of sin is destroyed. And so, this is why we need to take part in the truth of baptism. It's not enough to repent of your sins and stay as it is. That old man has to be dealt with. It has to be buried. Then only you can say, you can experience it being condemned in your flesh. I will explain that to you. The body of sin which was formed, which, for which you have repented of your sins, will be destroyed in baptism. That's what it says in Romans 6 verse 6. And as a result, uh, we can. it's a step to live an overcoming life. Romans 6 verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. It's a step to live a victorious life. It's so powerful. So this is why we need to understand this. So, and um, this body of sin was like a stronghold in us. It was also called, which is built up in us by the sins we, which we committed. And so it became stronger and stronger with every sin that we committed. But now in baptism is destroyed. Romans 7 verse 24. It is called a body of death. Body of death. And um, so when we are born again, the old man is crucified. That is, his deeds are exposed all what the old man made us to do, his deeds are exposed and put to open shame when we confess our sins. You are not being put to open shame. That old man, he is being put to, he's being exposed and he's put to open shame. And at baptism, the body of sin is destroyed. The old man is condemned. Judge, sentenced to death and locked up. So, until then, the old man has still dominion over us. And that body of still still remains as a stronghold within us, though we have confessed our sins. And so, 
We have to deal with it in the truth of baptism. Even after baptism, if we commit sin, we are building up a body of sin little by little once again. But once again as we repent and exercise ourselves in the truth of baptism, I am dead indeed to sin, alive unto God through Jesus Christ. When you say I am dead indeed to sin, this old man is locked up. And so practice this truth, preserve this experience of salvation every day and this baptism and this experience of repentance is not a one-off experience we have to practice it every single day so after we take baptism the old man is judged sentenced to death locked up so that we are no longer under his, under his control that's what it says in romans chapter 6 verse 7 he that is dead when you are ba baptized you are buried into the death of christ uh, we are baptized into his death romans 6 3 you are baptized into his death Romans 6, 7, he that is dead is freed from sin. You are freed from that sinful, disobedient nature. And what, and so therefore, you must keep this old man locked, judge, sentence and locked up. You have the key. You and I have the key. We must keep him locked up in this body. The key is our confession. What is that confession? According to Romans chapter 6 verse 11. I am dead indeed unto sin. I reckon, I count, I think myself dead indeed unto sin. I am dead indeed unto sin. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ. That key is your, that confession is your key. Every day lock him up. Lock up that old man. Oh, let him be judged. Sentenced to die and locked up. I am dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. And so, the old man is not destroyed yet. He is still alive in us. And so, he will keep begging, please, let me out, let me out, do this, do this, do that, do that with your five. He will try to pr provoke you through your five senses. Every time he tries to provoke you through your five senses, lock him up immediately. With a confession, I am dead indeed unto sin. He will be judged, sentenced to death, locked up. And so, therefore, see, that's why I said, it's, this is the deep truth. The way the apostles have taught it. And so, continue to keep this confession. Keep him, put him back into prison. If by chance you allowed him, repent. And once again, put him back into that prison. By confessing, I am dead to sin. And so, each time we do this, he's getting locked up, locked up, locked up. He, get weak, he will get weaker, weaker and weaker. He'll have no more strength to come out. Finally, at the rapture, he will die. Oh, at the rapture, when the Lord calls us home, when we are perfected in the will of God, he's working us, we will die. We are going to be raptured. Shall we praise God? Hallelujah. 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 Amen. So, by keeping, how to keep our body in the subjection? Firstly, by keeping this old man locked up with the confession, I am dead to sin. Sin means the disobedient nature. Then secondly, how can we keep this body under subjection? By doing the will of God in our lives. So, as I shared with you earlier, why we should surrender our bodies as a living sacrifice so so by doing the will of god in our lives as we surrender our bodies as a living sacrifice this uh, we are able to keep this body under subjection so we are not going to be a castaway at the coming of the lord god is going to preserve us so in baptism as i shared earlier we are already partaking of the obedience of christ we are being joined to him Chapter 6 verse 11, we are alive under God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are joined to him whose body was prepared to do the will of God. Our body has been prepared. When God dealt with us at repentance and in baptism, he has prepared our body. Now we are joined with Jesus whose body was prepared to do the will of God. We are surrendering our body to God to do his will. So it must not be once again conformed to the world. 
by yielding our members unto unrighteousness to disobey God. Instead, we must consecrate our body to God daily as those who are alive from the dead to do the will of God. And that as a result, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, present your bodies as a living sacrifice through the will of God. Verse 2, when you surrender yourself to meditate on that word which is giving to you, he will renew your mind and to know his perfect will and you can yield your members to God as instruments of righteousness to God. Yield your members as instruments of righteousness. All your members that come under your five senses. It is called a exercise unto godliness. Exercise unto godliness. Uh, physical exercise is good, but according to First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, for bodily exercise profiteth little. So it doesn't say don't exercise, but rather it says godliness, exercising unto godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So this exercise, every morning, don't fail to do this exercise. When you begin the day, say, surrender, Lord, I yield my members today. Romans 6 verse 13. I yield my members today to you as members that are dead to sin, alive unto you, to do your will. O oh, Father, I yield it to you to do your will, just as Jesus Christ, my Lord, did your perfect will. I yield it as instruments of righteousness to you. So God turns your members in the Greek, instruments, it means, here it means weapons. God will then take control of your surrendered body as you surrender all your members that come under the five senses one by one. And so, as you surrender to God, these members are dead to sin today, but alive unto you, O God, to do your will, just as Jesus Christ, my Lord, did your perfect will, I surrender my life, my body, are these members as instruments of righteousness to you. And then, God will use our members as instruments of weapons of righteousness. He will fill it with His power. He will fill it with His grace. That's why verse 14 says, Romans 6, 14, Grace will have dominion over you. Sin will not have dominion over you. You are not under the law, but under grace. Under the dominion of His grace. Power of God will come upon you. Just like on the altar. The sacrifice that is prepared according to God's word. The power of God. Fire of God will come down. And you surrender yourself like this. A power of God will come upon you. The grace of God will reign in you. And so, you will see God turning your members. Your members of your body. As weapons of righteousness to fight the enemy. To fight the devil, you know, we will be able to see then God helping us to fulfill all the righteousness of God, to do the will of God. And so, at one time, these were sinful, rebellious members. But when we give it to God now every day, He will take these members and use them as weapons to do what is right in His sight. Now we have become servants to righteousness. And so... He is doing a work, Romans 6 verse 4, being buried with him by baptism into death. We are, that verse means you are dying to the nature of sin, dead to sin, dead to the world. And a person who is buried is separated from those who are alive. Cut off from those who are, from everything in this world. So, baptism, you are buried into his death, dead to sin, dead to the world, and separated from the world. So, we are set apart from this world and from worldliness. Worldliness means the mindset of the world, the world, the way the world sees things. The world, which is, the word of God says, all that's of the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride, that's the world. But the whole world itself, once Adam and Eve had the dominion, when they sinned, the devil took over. Now the word of God says, that world is ruled, this world is ruled by Satan. That is, to those who will surrender themselves to him, he is ruling them, the God of this world. That's why it says in First John chapter 5, verse 19, the whole world is lying in the wicked one. First John 5, 19, is lying in wicked, in the wickedness means in the wicked one. 
So that's why we don't want anything that the world, all the lust of the flesh, lust of their pride, we don't want anything to it. Neither worldliness, the way the world sees things, the mindset of the world. We heard in that message last night, the devil said, if you will bow down and worship me, all this glory of this world I will give you. It's only a fleeting a world, glory that will pass away. The world in its lust thereof, First John 2, 17, will pass away into the lake of fire. All the spirits of lust, spirit of this world, Satan, all will pass away into the lake of fire. We don't want anything of the world. Neither worldliness. What is worldliness? What the world sees as great. Great. That is abomination in the sight of God. Luke 16, verse 15. What the world sees as great. That's what the devil offered him. All the greatness in this world. That is counted as abomination. Luke chapter 16, verse 15. What the world sees as great. Dear children of God, be very careful. Let us exercise this truth of baptism. Don't let anything of this world take over this pursuit of wanting to run this race and win the prize wanting to receive these truths and yield to the holy spirit being one being wanting to be steadfast in the apostles fellowship and doctrine and so let nothing else take it take its place if you have given room to that to take its place the world has taken over in your life if it's so come back to the right place today god is going to restore you so therefore god will give you grace god will give you grace and uh, he will help you to be restored to that right place so finally in conclusion in conclusion we read the word of god uh, is god is going to do this work in our lives and finally he is going to appear in all his glory to appear he's going to transform us now when the lord jesus died and rose again when the Lord Jesus died and rose again, when you surrender your body in this manner, you have victory over sin. You have victory over all kinds of sickness. You have victory over the world. You have victory over death. Physically, you have victory over sin, sickness and death. That's what we read in Revelation 1.18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Until we had the body of sin in us, until we were doing our will, that body of death ruled in us. Sickness had power over us. Dear child of God, if you have given your body to God to do the will of God, listen to this. If you have given your body to the will of God, sin, sickness, death, has no more power over you. The word of God says, Romans 8 2, the law of the spirit of life, the anointing, has power over you. The Lord will take control through the anointing over your heart and mind, bring it under the law of the spirit. Romans 5, verse 2, or 8, verse 2, and uh, there is no more condemnation as you walk after the spirit. And so, the law of the spirit sets you free from the law of sin and death. Law of death means the disobedient nature. Law of sin, that is the law of sin is the disobedient nature. Law of death, through the nature of sin, we committed all kinds of works of sin. We came under the law of death. The law of the spirit of life now, when you do the will of God, that has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's what it says here. I have the keys of hell and death. The Lord gives you victory over sin gives you victory over sickness and physical death also that's what this verse means this verse means that so now if he is the head and we are the body you and i have this same experience as we join with him with this body that is prepared to the will of god today you are going to see the lord delivering you in the little time we have left uh, we are going to get an anointing now the singers can come forward please they sing a very short uh, word song of the, which is going to uh, help us to come into the anointing. Very short because we want to finish by 12. Keep to the time. So Pastor Greg is going to come forward after that to come and say, say the final prayer. Now, what is all this likened to? 
it is likened to the year of jubilee in the old testament uh, is the likened to the year of the jubilee year of jubilee uh, the jubilee in the old testament the word of the the it is a year of release when the people would go back to their own those who were dispossessed go back to their lost inheritance at the coming of the lord we are going to possess first peter chapter 1 verse 4 and, uh, verse 4 and 5 an inheritance incorruptible undefiled and glorious what fades not away what is glorious we are going to go to that inheritance and while we are living we are going to be set free from all the things that bring us into bondage all sins all that's of the world every unsanctified characteristic we are going to be set free the release is taking place now at the rapture this body while corruptible Oh, dishonorable week. We are going to be set free from all the restrictions of this body. Jubilee. Oh, there's going to be a jubilee at the coming of the Lord. Oh, that's what we read in Leviticus 20, uh, 25 and in verse 10 and in verse uh, verse 13. So the Lord is going to do this work. Oh, it's Leviticus chapter 25 verse 10 verse 13 and 54. God is going to bring us back to an inheritance, set us free from all the bondage in this body too. Oh, that year of jubilee that is going to take place at the rapture. For all is sanctified, perfect, the overcoming and perfected saints shall be praised God. Hallelujah. Amen. Six two four. I come to do, do your will, oh my God. Your, your law is written. Jesus has shut the gates of hell and death for his saints. Now, 
sin has no power over us to bring us back into the gates of hell and death. When he died on the cross, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom he, and he rose victorious. The gates to Zion and New Jerusalem is open for his saints. Sin has no more power over you. Sickness has no power to bring any death. Right now, we are going to claim healing. Sickness has no more dominion in your body. Physical death has no more dominion. You have the keys of death that Satan is destroyed. Jesus overcame death and hell. You take the victory. You receive the healing. Just for one minute. And Pastor Greg is going to pray. Receive that anointing. Receive the healing. You receive that victory over sickness and death right now. Amen. Jesus has destroyed the, the devil who had the power of death. And every such spirit of sickness and whatever it be, thereby he abolished death. That means sickness, sin, and uh, has no power to bring spiritual death or physical death either. And that's the meaning he abolished death. Secondly, he overcame and overcame hell and death. Therefore, he has got the power, keys. You have the same power. Right now, you don't need to wait till tomorrow. Right now. As you surrender to the will of God, there is an anointing to heal you. Receive. Take that victory. Hallelujah. 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 All, that's all it takes. Just a moment. For the fullness of the power that he has given us. Oh, the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. The Lord has abolished death. He has given us victory over sin. He has given us victory over sickness. He has given us victory over the world. Over all things, over the devil. Shall we praise him? Amen. He has locked up the gate with the keys. He has locked up the gates of hell and death. Now for the saints of God, he has opened the gates of to Zion and New Jerusalem as we leave this truth. Shall we praise her? Oh God, our righteous Father in heaven, your spirit is good. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit moving in our midst even right now, Lord. Father, we thank you for the word of God, Lord, as Paul the Apostle said, he keeps his body under subjection. That he might win the prize. Run that he might obtain. We thank you, Lord, that through water baptism, Lord, we are buried into the death of Christ to be raised up to walk in newness of life. That the body of sin might be destroyed. 
We thank you, Lord, for that truth, Lord, that you died, Lord Jesus, to condemn sin in the flesh. The sin in that old man, Lord, has been judged and condemned. Lord, there's no good thing in man, only good thing in Christ. We thank you, Father, Lord, through water baptism, Lord, we can proclaim and reckon ourselves dead to sin, alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this great salvation, this great, Lord, work of redemption, Lord. We thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost, raising us up, Lord, to walk in newness of life, Lord, to have fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you, Lord, this body is going to be changed to be like the glorious body of our Lord Jesus, O oh God, hallelujah. Father, lead us, Lord, daily, Lord, to be changed from glory to glory in your image. Thank you, Lord, for these days of blessings, Lord. Let the revival continue, Lord. Father, thank you, Lord. Stir us up, Lord. Set the whole church on fire. Lord, let there be a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost that will prepare us all for your soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of us until Jesus appears in all his glory. Amen. This time, let us all shout three hallelujahs to the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 God bless you all.